فتوبوا إلى الله جميعا أيها المؤمنون لعلكم تفلحون First of all, the Barzakh life is a life which is a barrier, which has a barrier between this world that we live in and a world that is unexplainable to us. You can't understand it. It is a life of a certain type with its own, with its own, with its own, own reality. And it is nothing like this world. And it is not the here after the day of judgment, nor is it this world. It is somewhere in between. Allah says in the Quran, بَيْنَهُمَا بَرْزَخُ لَا يَبْغِيَانِ about the two oceans that meet in this life. It says, between them there is a barrier, the two seas do not mix. So this, this, we use the word barzakh. And the same word is used for that life after here, before the day of judgment. Allah says in the Quran, And behind them, after them, meaning after you die, there is a barzakh world until the day you are resurrected. This points out to us that there is a life barrier that does not mix with this life and does not mix with the day of judgment. But in a verse it talks about not mixing particularly between the life after death and this world that you're living. You can't mix. You don't know what's happening to them, they don't know what's happening to you. And you cannot understand them. When you are dead, you understand what's happened though. It's a barzakh, a barrier between this life and the next, the, when you're dead, before the day of resurrection. This barzakh world, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, as soon as you die, the soul begins to experience the barzakh world. If you want me to give you a slight example, if you want to get it closer to your minds, in a very slight example, but it's not exactly like that, Consider dreams when you're asleep. Your body is in the room. And everyone can see your body, witness your body, touch your body, hear you. But your soul is doing something different. Seeing something different. Hearing something different. Isn't that right? It's in a different place. Don't even know where you are sometimes. Or often. But your body is there. To the living person, the person who is awake, all I can tell you is, I see a body that's sleeping. <coughs> but you're in a whole different world. Some people are sleeping, they don't even know that they're sleeping. They think it's reality. And some people know that they're sleeping when they're dreaming. Have you ever experienced that? You know you're asleep? So the Barzakh world is similar to when your soul goes out when you're asleep. Similar. You don't require oxygen. Have you ever seen yourself in your dream underwater and you're talking? <laughs> okay, sometimes it's a result of the brain, we know that. But also the soul does go to places where it do, the soul doesn't need to survive on what use your body survives. The body survives on food and oxygen, but the soul doesn't. So if you can understand dreams, you can understand the barzakh. As for me, I don't think anybody understands the phenomena of dreams and the way the soul comes out when you're asleep. And similarly, we cannot comprehend the Barzakh world. This Barzakh world, my dear brothers and sisters, is a temporary station between here and the hereafter, the Day of Judgment. In this temporary Barzakh world, a person is able to find out if they are going to heaven or hell. Because the Prophet wasallam said, the Hadith of the Prophet wasallam says, إِنَّ الْقَبْرَ أَوَّلُ مَنَازِلِ الْآخِرَةِ فَإِنْ نَجَى مِنْهُ أَحَدٍ فَمَا بَعْدَهُ أَيْسَرَ مِنْهُ وَإِنْ لَمْ يَنْجُ مِنْهُ فَمَا بَعْدَهُ أَشَدَّ مِنْهُ أو أَشَدُّ مِنْهُ The grave is the first part of the hereafter, of the day of judgment. If he or she is saved from the punishments and torments of the grave, then whatever is after it is going to be better and easier. He'll be saved from more bigger things. If he is not saved from the torments and punishments of the grave, then whatever is going to come after that is going to be worse. 
And we mentioned last week that a believer, when he sees his place in Jannah, when the angels show him in, paradise, in, in the grave, he says, oh my Lord, let the last hour come. I want to go to Jannah. And the disbeliever says, when they see their place in hellfire, when the angels show him in the grave, he says, oh my Lord, don't let the last hour come. Don't let it go. Because he knows that what's going to come after that is going to be worse. My brothers and sisters in Islam, when a person goes to the grave, the Prophet ﷺ tells us, he or she takes with them three things. One stays and two return. Who knows what, that, what these three things are. When we take the body to the grave, it takes with it three things. One stays there and two return. The Prophet ﷺ said, your family and your wealth return, your wealth's not going to go with you in the grave. Unless you do what, what that, I remember about uh, 13 years ago, this old woman died, she had a beautiful, she had this car, this classic car. And that's all she loved in her life. Her children left her, family left her, but she had this beautiful 50 model, 50s model car. And in her will, she wanted to be buried with it. So they made the grave huge, and they buried her in the car. <laughs> if you want to be like that, even then you don't take your wealth. Your body decays and your car stays. Someone comes, digs it up and takes it. But what's, what comes back is your wealth and your family. Your family forgets you. You know what I mean by forget? I mean they remember you physically in the head. But slowly you get on with your life afterwards. What stays with you are your deeds. Your good and bad deeds. Because that's what's going to determine where you're going to be and what's going to happen to you in your grave. Brothers and sisters in Islam, al-barzakh life means that a person will be either punished or rewarded in a certain way in there and it is the sign for what is going to come next. The Prophet ﷺ indicates or tells us that the dead people visit each other in their grave. Now, the dead people visit each other in their grave. For he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when you bury your dead, then make their kafan, make their shroud nice, and put on beautiful fragrance to them, make them presentable. For the people of the grave yatazawarun, they visit one another. For the Prophet wasallam told us about this scenario that it will happen. He said, Hassinu akfana mawtakum fa'innahum yatabahawna wa yatazawarun fi quburihim. Make their shroud nice, for in their grave, the dead people visit each other. And in Sahih Muslim, Prophet Sallallahu said, If any of you put the shroud on your brother, then make it presentable. Presentable, meaning it's an image, but someone else is going to see it. There is a similar hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu tells us uh, that bury your dead with the salihun, with the righteous people. For the neighboring person of a grave can harm the person who is next to them if they are being punished. They said, Ya Rasulullah, when they're dead, how are they going to be harmed? He said, won't you get harmed by your neighbor in real life? They said, yes. He goes, and therefore when you're dead, you get harmed by your neighboring dead person. So if you can, Choose a grave that is righteous. If you cannot, it's okay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will look after them, make dua for them. Bi'idhnihi ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us to think about these moments. He said, أَمَا أَنَّكُمْ لَوْ أَكْثَرْتُمْ مِنْ ذِكْرِ هَادِ مِنْ لَذَّاتِ لَشَغَلَكُمْ عَمَّا أَرَى يعني الموت فَأَكْثِرُوا ذِكْرَ هَادِ مِنْ لَذَّاتِ الموت فإنه لم يأتي على القبر يوم إلا تكلم فيه فيقول أنا بيت الغربة. Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم used to say, talk a lot about death. يعني not just death, talk about the hereafter. Talk about the purpose of life. When you talk about the hereafter, it means you're talking about the purpose of why you're actually here. He said, for it is if you were to talk about it a lot, then it will help you 
not to be distracted by what I see. And when you go into the grave, the grave talks to you. And the grave says, I am the house of the strangers. I am the house of being alone. I am, and the Prophet ﷺ said, the closest Allah is to his servant, or one of the closest times he is to his servant is when he's in the grave. When he has no father or mother or children or brothers or sisters to accompany him or friends, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there for him, for a believer. The Prophet sallallahu told us that a person who is being punished in their grave, the animals can hear him or her. Al Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us in a hadith where he said, Ali radiallahu an or Aisha radiallahu anha said, Two old Jewish women entered my house one time in Medina because they were neighbors. And they said to me, The people of the grave get punished inside their graves. So I said to them, you are lying. This is not true. People in their graves don't get punished. Then they left. Then the Prophet ﷺ entered and I said, Ya Rasulullah, two old women from the Jews came to me and said, the people of the grave get, are getting punished in their graves. The Prophet ﷺ said, Sadaqata, innahum yu'adhabuna adhaban tasma'uhu al-baha'im. They spoke the truth. Those two Jewish women. The people of the grave who are getting punished, they get punished until the animals can hear them. So the human beings and the jinns can't hear them, but the animals can hear them every now and then. She said, I never saw the Prophet ﷺ after that day in prayer or after prayer except that he would be seeking refuge in Allah from the punishment of the grave. Now, I don't mean to scare you, but it is our deeds which inevitably decide what the status of our graves are going to be like. Either a garden from the gardens of paradise or a pit from the pits of hellfire. So the Prophet ﷺ himself is to say, أعوذ بالله من عذاب القبر. Oh my Lord, I seek your protection from the punishment of the grave. And this is what we should be doing as well. This is the hadith which is narrated in Bukhari, by the way. And in another hadith, Prophet ﷺ said, تسمعه البهائم كلها All of the animals can hear him when he is being punished. Meaning every now and then, all animals, all types of animals can hear. And the Prophet ﷺ passed by two graves one time. This is also Sahih Hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, where he saw two graves and the Sahabas were with him. And he went to some, a, a particular type of plant, and he cut off a bit of its branches and placed one on one grave and another one on the other grave with his hands. And they asked him, why did you do that, Ya Rasulullah? Because that's not normally what you do to, for people who have died it's for their graves. This is not the norm. But the Prophet ﷺ did it especially just for these two. He said, Innahuma yu'adhaban, wama yu'adhabani bi kabir. They are being punished right now. But they are not being punished with something big. What, what he means by something big, meaning in our eyes, we don't consider it as a huge thing. But to Allah, it is a big thing. That's why they're being punished. Because Allah doesn't punish you for something small. He'll punish you for something that's severe. That's really severe. But in our eyes, we don't see it as severe. Because we take it for granted. He said the first person is being punished because he used to spread rumors about people and causes bad reputation to others. And causes you know, fitness by spreading rumors and gossiping about people lies about people and the second person he used to not urinate in privacy so he would urinate in open and people would see his private part it's just like that 
In another tafsir, it tells us, and Allah knows best, that he didn't cleanse himself from urination, he used to pray like that, with the impurities deliberately. Allah knows best, either of them are big sins. He said, I placed those clovers, maybe because of my hands placing them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will lessen their punishment until the clovers have withered away. And these were Muslims from the Ummah of the Prophet Or actually, Zayd ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu narrated that once while the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was passing through a grove or a grave owned by the tribe of Banu Najjar, Arabic tribe called Banu Najjar, the Prophet sallam was seated on his camel or his mule and the mule unexpectedly turned its course and it seemed that it would throw him down. It was about to throw the Prophet ﷺ off it as if it's afraid of something. Like when a horse sees a snake. All of a sudden, five or six graves came into view. The Prophet ﷺ inquired, Does anyone know who are buried in these graves? And a man said, I do. Or a companion of the Prophet said, I do. And he asked, when did they die? The Prophet ﷺ asked. And the companion replied, during the days of Jahiliyyah. Yani the days before Islam came up. The Prophet ﷺ remarked, they are undergoing punishment in the grave. Were I not afraid that you would, un you, were, were I not afraid that you would not be able to bury your dead, I would have prayed to God to let you to hear a part of the punishment of the grave that I am hearing. And if it wasn't that I knew that you bury each other, I would have let you hear. I asked Allah to let you hear what I'm hearing right now. But if you were to hear it, you probably wouldn't bury each other anymore. After saying this, the Prophet ﷺ turned towards us and observed. He said, seek the protection of Allah from the punishment of hell. We all said, A'udhu Billahi min adhab al qabr min adhab al nar The Prophet ﷺ then said, Seek the protection of Allah from the punishment of the grave. And they said, A'udhu Billahi min adhab al qabr The Prophet ﷺ then said, Seek the protection of Allah from every mischief, manifest as well as hidden. So they said, A'udhu Billahi min al fitani ma dhahra minha wa ma batan. The Prophet ﷺ then said, Seek the protection of Allah from the gravest mischief of Dajjal. So we said, Na'udhu Billahi min fitnati dajjal This is the hadith of Prophet Sallallahu which is narrated correctly in Muslim. And also there is a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu which is in Bukhari and Muslim that now I would like to take you on that journey just for a little while to witness what is happening in the life of Al-Barzakh right now. As we are living now, things in the barzakh that are occurring. Firstly, before I mention this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ told us that when a person dies, their soul goes to a place, a destination, that you and I cannot see or witness in the barzakh world. The soul goes either to where the believing souls and good souls are gathered, or it goes to where the disbelieving souls and the filthy or the bad souls are gathered. And neither of the two... Neither of the two meet each other. They're in bliss, they're in punishment. And when the believing soul goes to the believing place, the believing dead people, their souls run to it. Like a person who is traveling, going overseas, you know how everyone runs to you to ask you about family and friends that they have back at where you came from, right? How are they doing? How's their health? How's... So similarly, in the Barzakh world, the believing souls run to, the, to this new soul that is just fresh dead person and they ask them about their brothers, their sisters, mothers, fathers, children, relatives, friends who they have left behind. What are they asking them about? They are asking them about their faith. They are asking them about their deeds. How are they doing? Are they coming close to Allah? Have they gone astray? What's happening to them? So it means that they miss them. They miss them and they want the best for them. But they don't know what's happening to them. So this freshly dead person says to them what he knows about them. If he tells them good, 
they become happy. Because they know that if they die now, they're going to meet them. They're going to be with them. Especially, especially family. Yani parents and children, family, brothers and sisters. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَاتَّبَعَتْهُمْ بِإِيمَانٍ أَلْحَقْنَا بِهِمْ وَاتَّبَعَتْهُمْ ذُرِّيَّتُهُمْ بِإِيمَانٍ أَلْحَقْنَا بِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ وَمَا أَلَتْنَاهُمْ مِنْ عَمَلِهِمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ And those who believe truly and they died Allah and their offspring believed with them and they died Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reunite them together and will not take any of their rewards away So dead people who die believers will follow their believing family and that's the only concern of the souls of the dead people in the hereafter. As for the bad soul who goes to the bad destination, they also run asking. And if they tell them they're doing good, they actually get relieved. And if they're doing bad, they also get upset. Because they have seen what has happened. But if they go to the believing section, and they ask them, where is the soul? Or what did our relative do? Or our father or brother or whoever it is? And the freshly dead person says, he beat, he beat me. Sometimes you may say, he beat me, and he died before me. They become very upset because they know that they didn't come to the believing soul's side. He went to the other side. So they have no idea. The Prophet's journey. The narrator says, every time the Prophet would meet us in the masjid, or see us in a gathering, he would ask, who has seen a dream today? Because dreams are another part of prophethood. Prophet Sallallahu said, when prophethood goes, dies away, the only part of prophethood that is left are dreams. Dreams tell you things that we don't know. But the dreams agree with the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu They don't go against it. Yani. They agree with the Prophet's words. Whatever you see, it agrees with it. For example, some people may see the hereafter, or as if the world is ending, or heaven, or hell. They may see angels, and jinns, and stuff. So these agree with the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, and ayat in the Quran. It's not something new. Like someone comes up and says to me, I saw a dream that I'm a prophet. This disagrees with the deep. One brother comes up to me one day, he says, I've got a special news. You've got to do this and you've got to do that. And you, well, like, totally against Islam. I've never heard it before. I said, where'd you get this? He smiled and says, no, brother, you see, Allah gave me some new message. Because the Prophet said, part of prophethood is dreams. And I'm a prophet now. Sure. Look at this delusion. And I think that's how people become insane out there. And they develop new religions. They use this dream issue. For any dreams that go against the sunnah is not a dream from Allah. Subhanahu wa it's from the shaitan. Some people, they say... I saw God in my dreams and I spoke to him. That's the shaitan trying to make you think it's God. I think it was uh, Abdul Qadir al Jilani, Shaykh Abdul Qadir al Jilani, who says, This is the truth about what, what we read about him, not the false. He says, I saw a dream of this being come up in front of me, full of light, and he said to me, I'm your Lord. Making me think that it's God, Allah. So I asked it, Are you Allah, the one who there is no other but Him? No God worthy of worship but Him? He said, I'm your Lord. He asked him again, He asked him, he said, I'm your Lord. Finally, then he vanished. And he knew it was the shaitan. Because a shaitan cannot answer that question. Say, I am. A shaitan can't say, I am Allah who is no God worthy of worship. Anyway, the Prophet used to ask this question. One day, the Prophet Sallallahu he himself saw a dream. And when the Prophets see a dream, it's absolutely true from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, no doubt. They either see from Allah or nothing. Different to us. And he said, Atani atini layla. This night, last night, someone came to me in my dreams, meaning angels. They came to me too. And they took me into the skies, into the life of the barzakh into another world of the dead, the world of the dead. It doesn't say the world of the dead, but Prophet ﷺ means here that he took him to the world of the unseen. And it is the world of the dead. Soon you'll see how, what I mean. 
He said, we reached a place. I saw before me a man who was lying down on the floor, on his back. And there was another man, a big man holding a huge stone. He would come up to this man lying on the floor and he'd throw the stone onto his head. And he'd crush his head and the stone, stone roll, would roll away. The man would go to pick up the stone and by the time he comes back to the, to, to the person on the ground, his head has been restored. And he'd crush it again. The stone would roll away. And he'd keep doing that over and over. So I asked them, who is this man on the floor and why is that other man doing this to him? They said to me, move on, move on. Don't ask questions, keep going. He said, then we moved on. Then we passed by a man who had a, a, a hook, a, a brass hook in the front of his hands. Or actually, a, a man who was sitting down. And there was another man behind him who had a brass hook. And he would place the hook on the front of his face from his mouth and he would rip his mouth and eyes and, and, and half of the face to his ear. Then he would come to the other side of his face and rip his other side of his face to the other ear. When he'd go to the other side, the first side is restored. Then he'd do the same to the restored side and then the other side is restored and then he'd do it again. And he'd keep on doing that over and over again. Prophet ﷺ asked, who is this person and why is that other man doing this to him? They said, move on, move on. He said, I reached a man who was swimming in, an, in, a, in, a, in a lake which looked like blood. And there was another man at the, on the edge. He had stones in his hands. The man would swim to the, to the other man. The other man would put stones into his mouth and he would have to swallow them and carry them across. And he would bring them out on the other side and he would come back, swim back, take another stone, put it on the other side and continuously do that. He said, why is this man doing this and who is the other man? He said, move on. They said, move on, move on. He said, we reached a place. He said, I saw men and women who were naked inside of a, what looked like a tanur. Tanur is like, in the olden days, this oven. They used to use these ovens to bake in their bread and stuff. Tanur is very deep and hollow and it has fire un underneath it. Very hot in there. He said, I saw men and women in a huge Tanur. Huge. As much as the eye could see. And they were hanging in there. And the fire would burn from underneath and burn them. And they would all scream. And the fire would come back. Then it would burn them and it would all scream and come back. He said, who are these people and why is this happening to them? They said, move on, move on. He said, I reached and saw a man so tall that I could look up and I could barely see his face. But he was beautiful. He had a white beard. And around him were children. Lots and lots of children. In a beautiful garden. He said, who is this and who are these children? They said, move on, move on. He said, we moved on. And I saw a group of people, a group of men and women, people. One side of their body, of their face, was the most handsomest and beautiful that I've ever seen. And the other side of their face and body was the most gruesome and ugliest I've ever seen. Then they'd walk to a river and they'd bathe in it. And then the side that was ugly was restored to be as beautiful as the other side. And so they were completely beautiful as I've ever seen. I asked, who are these people and why is this happening to them? The angel said, move on, move on. He said, I came to a man, this big man, and his face was the most hideous and ugliest I have ever laid eyes on. And he didn't smile. I asked, who is this person? And they said, move on, move on. Finally, as the dream was almost over, I turned to my companions and I said, this night I have seen many strange things. Can you explain them to me? And they told him, the first person that was having a man crushing his head is either, we don't know the exact of Syria, either an example or it is real. But 
with nevertheless this is what will happen or what it is happening to the person who dies before the day of judgment he said that was a man who used to deliberately sleep past his duties his prayers his head is too heavy to get up for his prayers and so he is being punished like this until the day of judgment the second person who were having hooks ripping their sides of their faces to their ears said these are the people who used to spread lies about other people walk out of their home and spread lies about this person and that person rumors lies and they carry on information without making sure if it's true and they carry it about the other people ruining their lives and their reputations namima it's called namima yamshi bin namima walking in rumors and gossiping about other people so it's being ripped this is punishment till the day of judgment the third person who was swimming and having these stones he said riba. he is the person who consumes interest riba usury yani he is not in need it's not a necessity for them to consume riba or to to take it or to or to give it and they did it so they are being punished this way until the day of judgment what's going to happen is going to be worse he said the people that were in the tanur in that big huge oven underneath and screaming from the heat were the adulterers and adulteresses fornicators and fornicatresses of this ummah of this nation as for the people who had one side beautiful and the other side ugly and they would wash from the river and they would be restored he said these are the people whose good deeds are equal with their bad deeds they burn a little bit or these are the people whose good deeds weren't enough sorry to make them enter jannah so they have burnt for their bad deeds and then they are saved from the fire or they will be saved from the fire and they will cleanse themselves from this river in Jannah and they'll be restored. As for the tall man that you saw with children around him, that is Prophet Ibrahim salam. And those children are the children of believers and non-believers who died before the age in which the Sayyidat are placed upon them, for the age of maturity. As for the man who you saw was hideous and didn't smile then this is malik the angel guardian of the fire of hellfire he has never smiled since the day the fire hellfire was created by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he is the guardian who makes sure the people of hellfire are being tortured for their choice of going against allah and refusing his message but these are examples of the things that are happening or will happen in the life of the Barzakh. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save us from those punishments. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. So then, Hayat al Barzakh is this way. Al Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us here are some of the ways in which. The punishments can be lessened or forgiven and in your grave your light can be increased even though your, your deeds are not enough to increase the light or to make your, 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 your journey better he said there are ways that the dead person can still receive benefit in here and in their grave and their state will be better when the son of Adam dies all of their actions are cut off Khalas, there's nothing that you can do anymore except for three things a righteous child that will supplicate for you or an ongoing knowledge or a beneficial knowledge which you left behind that people can benefit from or an ongoing charity which you left behind that people can benefit from ongoing charity In a hadith it says that a person who is in their grave 
their deeds will be enough to give them as much light as it should be. Suddenly they see as time goes on, nur, more light and provision is given to them. And they say, oh my Lord, where is this light coming to me from? And a reply comes to him saying, Laka waladun salihun yad'ulak. You have a righteous child that is supplicating for you. Now, because this is your work which you left behind. So my dear brothers and sisters, your children, your children, let them be your investment. Not so they can take over your company in this life, but so that they can supplicate for you and be your investment in the hereafter. Your children can be your biggest enemies in the hereafter or the best thing that's ever happened to you. It depends how you develop them. After the Barzakh world, the people stay in there for only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows how long the people stay in their graves. Until the day of judgment arrives and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs or commands the angel Israfil to blow into the trumpet for the world to end. That is when the dead are risen and everyone on earth and in the heavens whom Allah wills will die. The Prophet sallallahu said, you'll stay in your graves for 40. The companions who narrate this hadith say, we don't know. If he meant 40 years, 40 days, 40 hours, Allahu A'la, 40 months. But you stay for a while before the resurrection in that state. The body decays. It goes. And if you opened up a grave, you won't see your body being punished. Similar as we said to the example of when you're asleep. However, it is being punished in a world that you cannot understand or being rewarded in a world that you also cannot understand. It is a sunnah for the people to pay condolences to the family of the dead person. And the way we pay condolences, I'd like to take this opportunity to mention this, is not necessarily in the cultural way that we are used to these days. I don't know how your culture is, but in my culture, in the Arabic culture, or in the Lebanese culture in particular, they have something called the Aza for three days. And some of them have it for seven days. Others have it for 40 days. And in that time, they're not allowed to get along with their normal daily duties as, as they usually used to. So not, not allowed to be happy. And not, not allowed to celebrate in anything. Uh, so they, can see, they, they, they seclude themselves from things. And this is actually a cultural practice, not from Islam. Condolences to the family can be done at any time. It's okay for the, the family of the deceased to welcome people to their house. That's okay. But you don't have to number days as though the third day after that, no one's allowed to pay me condolences anymore. And I'm upset with you. No. Condolences can be done even after that. And the way that they are done is not traditionally the way we do them today. I don't know in your culture, but in my culture, there is a more of a burden on the family of the deceased to prepare food and sweets for the people who come and visit them. Is this a celebration? The sunnah is quite the opposite. The Prophet ﷺ advised us that when we go to visit the, the deceased of the dead, we, we make food for them. As the Prophet ﷺ used to say to his wives, make food for Ali Ja'far. Ali Ja'far had a deceased in their family and he said, make food and take it to Ali Ja'far. This is a time to assist them and to help them in their grief. They have to eat, they have to breathe, they have to rest. We don't go there and make them give us the coffee and the sweets. And the... I went to a, an occasion like this once and they didn't have sweets. The people who visited them walked out talking about them, saying, sure, what's this? We're coming to a Aza, you know, and they don't give us sweets? What kind of ingenerosity is this? Subhanallah, <laughs> the minds are twisted. What can you do? How do you inform this person? Anyway, a word of remembrance there, a word of advice. 
maybe not even advice, a word of, 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 of kindness to make the people assist them. A Muslim is happy for the happiness of their brothers and sisters and is sad with the sadness of their brothers and sisters. We are like one body and in these occasions we do so. And it is okay to hug the person and to cry with them if you like. But the crying over the dead person exaggerated is haram. It's haram. And the dead person actually, according to a hadith, the dead person yata'adha, yata'adha, he can be harmed from the overcrying of the people of his family on him. How is this? The ulama told us that this means if the person who has died knows definitely that their family will, you know, pinch themselves and hit themselves and, 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 and rip their hair out and scream and yell, and he doesn't write in his will not to do this, he may be, he may hold accountability for this. Write it in your will. But if he didn't know, then he doesn't hold accountability. And if he told them and they continue to do that, he also doesn't hold accountability. Also, in your will, if you have written for someone to do something that's against the, the, the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, you are also held in accountability. This man wrote, he said, I want you to use $40,000 of my money to build my grave and make it really nice as much as you can. So that when people come to visit, it's presentable. Subhanallah. If only that miskin knew that when you die, if you were able to come back out, you will say to them, please stop, use that money and give it in charity, please, I need the rewards. When the son of Adam dies, all of his actions are cut off except for three. One of them, at ongoing charity. And the Prophet ﷺ told us in a long hadith, he used to say, there are many forms of ongoing charities. He said, planting a tree on behalf of the dead is a charity. I'll read it in Arabic. Sab'un yajri ajruha lil abdi ba'da mawtihi wa huwa fi qabrihi. There are seven things which keep going for the dead person, benefiting them in their grave while they are dead in their grave. Man allama ilman, whoever teaches a knowledge. Aw ajra nahran, or let go a stream, fountain for people to drink from or, or feed their crops from. Aw hafara bi'ran, or built a well for people to drink. Aw gharasa nakhlan, or planted a palm tree or any other tree for people to benefit from. Aw bana masjidan, or built a masjid, or contributed in building a masjid where people come. Yani for example, this masjid, whoever's contributed in it, and they died. For the people who come here and pray, they get rewarded. Subhanallah. Even if it's a dollar, one dollar, contribute to the masjid. Aw waratha mushafan, or left behind them a Quran, or a piece of Islamic knowledge which people can learn from. Or left behind them a child asking Allah forgiveness for them. After he's dead, then all of this will benefit the dead person. Some scholars said that this hadith has some issues with, but its meaning is correct and it supports the meaning of the other hadith, which ongoing charity, knowledge which is beneficial, and a righteous child who will make dua for you. The method and the way that you die also assists you in your grave. Like a person, this is actually spot on the hadith of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The person who dies guarding the believers for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will be forgiven all their sins. And in their grave they will see nothing of this hawl, of, of its thing. And Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said every person, Muslim or um, practicing or not, companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or not, they will have dhammatul qabr. The grave will actually tighten upon them and then release. And Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if anyone was to be saved from that, it would have been Sa'd ibn Mu'ad. But even he was not saved from that one. And Allahu A'lam what the wisdom of that is. We ask Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala to save us from hawl, al-qiyamah, from the punishment of the grave, and from the terrors of the hereafter. Allahu Allah.